So for week two of the genomics lab, we're going to be looking at the field of bioinformatics and getting an introduction to some of the methods and approaches to using bioinformatics to do data analysis. In the course of this week's lab, I'm hoping that you'll be able to really understand the different components that make up a genome, be able to use quantitative evidence to support assessment of our sequencing experiment, be able to conduct some standard bioinformatic analyses for being able to identify an unknown sequence by matching it to an existing database, and also make a novel contribution to some discovery-based science, in this case, a genome sequencing project on a species that has never been genome sequenced before. So it's the opportunity to make a really novel and new contribution to this research effort. So first off, what is bioinformatics? Uh, well, if we just look at a strict definition of it, um, we could call it an applied field of study that uses the practice of information processing. And that means data management, data analysis, and interpretation of data to study biological systems. This is an interdisciplinary field, so it includes more than just biology. We need to take into consideration a certain amount of computational science, statistics, mathematics, and even engineering in how we approach this field. One of the reasons why bioinformatics is becoming more and more important in the field of biology is that our field, just like many research fields, is becoming incredibly data rich. As you'll see in the sequence ex experiment that we've done for this lab, which is a very small scale experiment, we are already generating enormous sized data sets in very short amount of time. The costs that it costs to, to do such have gone dramatically down as we discussed last week. And thus, there's a big push for us to be able to do work at a much higher level, much more data intense level. And you, as future scientists, will face those same pressures. So it's good that we get a little experience here with it. A little introduction, a little taste. Um, bioinformatics was, became, has become most established in the fields of genetics and genomics, um, but has also been widely used in other areas of biological, of biological sciences and other sciences. Uh, but within biology, these include landscape ecology, evolution, marine science, cell biology, population biology, all different types of biology. Right? We apply bioinformatics or large big data uh, approaches to all different kinds of areas now, not just genetics and genomics. And it's basically the biological version of what is sometimes referred to as data science, which is kind of a catch term these days for anything involving lots of data analysis. So what are we gonna use it for? Well, one of the things that we're gonna first look at is how we can use uh, environments like R to summarize data. And this is an important part of any sort of experimental investigation. We need to be able to communicate our results. We wanna show overall pattern, we wanna show variation, and we wanna show how what we observed relates to what we might have expected to observe. How that might relate to any hypotheses we might have going into the experiment. There are some common summary statistics we use to describe the distribution of data. So the, the observations and the pattern in the observations that we observed. And those include the mean, the median, variance or standard deviation, which just says how much variation is in our observations or in our data, the range of observations, and also visual representations. And so over here on the right of the screen, you see both a box plot above and a histogram down below, a frequency histogram. And we're gonna be using uh, R to generate some figures similar to these. Now by using these types of terms and these types of figures, we're able to communicate with other scientists the general, the general nature of our data set and allowing us to communicate and them to respond and understand the work that we've done. Another task that we'll be undertaking in addition to summarizing data uh, this week will be the identification of unknown sequences. So we've working, we're working on a novel genome sequencing project. So how do we identify these unknown sequences, sequences that no one has ever seen before? Uh, well, we're going to use two main tools, and they basically work by taking an unknown query and aligning it to a, to a known subject, in this case, a an existing database, publicly available database. The two tools that we'll be using is BLAST and DFAM. BLAST, uh, which stands for the basic local alignment search tool uh, is, allow, is going to allow us to um, search through a bunch of sequences and find the, the sequence in that database that best aligns to our unknown query. DFAM takes a slightly different approach. It's targeted towards identifying specifically repetitive elements. Instead of an exact sequence, we're actually trying to align a sequence to a profile. 
a certain kind of, kind of profile card, a hidden Markov model uh, profile, but a certain profile. So a little less specific than the DNA than the alignment to a sequence. But overall, we have this idea of we're looking for two sequences that are similar to each other. Why is that important? Well, typically we believe that sequence similarity indicates whether or not two things uh, have shared ancestry or homology to each other. We want to know whether or not they're related. And also, things that we have similar sequences could could also have similar function. Um, this could happen. This could be because historically they they've done the same thing, or it can happen due to convergence, where two sequences and two different organisms might evolve to look similar because they're trying to accomplish the same tasks. It's important when we think about this that we think about what are the different parts of a genome as we go and we blast, right? So we're looking at blast, we're looking at DFAM, we're looking for different types of things. What are the types of things that we see in a genome? If we look at the human genome and we parse it out by the things that the different kinds of entities that we find in the human genome, we find that there are, you know, the parts that we often think of being the most important, the genes and the gene-related sequences. And if we think about it, about how much of the human genome of the 3.2 gigabases of the human genome, only about 1.2 of those gigabases is actually associated with genes and gene-related sequence. And of that, only around 3% of the entire genome is associated with any coding sequence whatsoever. Uh, it's a very small portion of the genome, which is actually coding for proteins. And even a, and it is even a, a small portion of the genome which is associated with those coding sequences. A lot of it is associated with things, you know, uh, gene fragments, pseudogenes, things that have nothing to do, or we think have little to do, with functional content in the genome. A large section of the genome is made up of repetitive elements, as we can see over on the right side of the slide. About um, almost two-thirds of the genome is made up of this intergenic regions, meaning between genes, that uh, account for a big section of this. A lot of these repeats are related to um, transposable elements. Uh, down here are these lines, signs, LTR elements, and DNA transposons. And they make up a significant portion of our genome. If we look across genomes of many different organisms, what we can see here is that, if, that even in each family, we see huge variation in the size of genomes. Just look at the protozoans, where, where Plasmodium falciparum, where the uh, malarial parasite, it's only got a 23 megabase genome that's 23 million bases long. Where if we go to the, ame to the amoeba, it's 200,000 megabases long. Right? Even when we're looking at vertebrates, we can see that there is a huge difference in, there's an order of magnitude difference between the puffer fish and human. We look at plants, we see the same thing. Arabidopsis, down about 135 megabases. Then we look over at wheat. 16,500 megabases. What's accounting for all these differences in the size of these genomes? Well, when we look and we compare genomes from multiple species that have very different size genomes. So in this case, we're looking at the human genome, the largest one in this case, the yeast genome, which is significantly smaller, and then Drosophila melanogaster and the maize genome. All the green sections indicate where we see exons, things that code for proteins. And one thing that's obvious is that when we look at yeast, it's a very exon-dense genome. Right? But when we look at human and we look at Drosophila and we look at maize, we see that the density of exons decreases. The density of genes decreases. And what we're seeing here is that what accounts a lot for the differences that we see among genomes is not in the actual amount of coding sequence in these genomes, it's in how dense they are and how much repetitive element they have in them. So it's important that when we think about what makes up the genome, we understand that not only is it important we look at the genes, but it's also important that we look at the repeats. And we've talked about this in class. You guys all did a PCR experiment where you, you looked for PV92, which is a sign, which is a alu element that is a specific type of repetitive element in the human genome. The databases that we're going to search for these things are uh, one is comes from NCBI, it's called NT, and that includes all the nucleotide um, sequences that are publicly available. And then DFAM, which is a publicly available transposable element or repetitive element database. It's important when we think about these types of questions that we try to remember and put in the context of how do the things that we find tell us something about the organism? Why are they important? Why are they interesting? So as you go through and you do your expo exploration of this organism, Think about what you find. Does this tell you anything about the organism? Does it tell you anything about its evolutionary history? Does it tell you anything about its biology? What might it tell you? What might what questions might you come up be able to come up with after seeing this thing? And keep in mind, you'll be the first person to see it.